and thank you for joining us for creating accessible content for content creators. This webinar is being presented by Results One LLC. It is funded through a grant with the U.S. Small Business Administration. All opinions, conclusions, and or recommendations expressed herein are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the SBA. And at this time, I'd love to hand it over to Kim Alfonso of Results One LLC to take it away. And thank you, Alexis, and good afternoon, everyone. As Alexis shared, my name is Kim Alfonso. I am CEO of Results One LLC. We are a woman and minority owned small business located in Washington, DC. I'm an African-American female with short brown hair, wearing black eyeglasses and a beige top. And what most people don't know about me is my foray into the disability world began about 22 years ago when my daughter Alexandra was born. I'm proud to say she's at Catholic University and a senior. But she was born with Peter's anomaly, which resulted in her having very limited vision and being a braille reader and a cane traveler. And like many parents, when you have a child, period, and or have a child with a disability, you immerse yourself in learning as much as possible to become the best advocate for your child. So for the past 22 years, I've been working in the blindness industry on boards, parent organizations, Maryland School for the Blind, DC Advisory Board for Special Education, and spent 12 years as Chief Operating Officer at Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind. So this topic of accessibility and creating accessible content is very personal to me as I have watched my daughter and other visually impaired I and mean, blind children struggle with online accessibility issues during school, um, applying for scholarships, internships, accessing materials, and most, re most frequently, I mean recently, when my daughter um, back in 2019, um, 2020, was trying to access and learn about um, where to go to get her COVID shot. Um, the, the website was inaccessible to her. So personally, I know what it means to lack access to websites and mobile apps. Um, so again, um, I hope you all will really enjoy what we're getting ready to share with you and learn from it. Um, I am going to move right on to next, which is what are we going to cover today? So today we're going to provide you all with an overview of accessibility. We're going to talk a little bit about creating accessibility, accessible content. What are some of the accessibility checks that you need? We'll talk about user interface, user experience accessibility and printed media, what you need to know, and then Q&A. And as, you, as we go through this presentation, if questions come up, um, please put them in the chat. Um, we've got a fairly sizable group, and so we'll try to handle them as we're going through the presentation, but if not, we'll certainly make sure at the end that we go back to um, the questions that you have placed in the chat. So let's get started. First, let's review the definition of digital and website accessibility. So digital accessibility, refers to the inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites, digital tools and technologies, and this is including video, audio, electronic documents, animations, your kiosks, mobile apps by people with disabilities. And web accessibility means that websites, tools, and techniques are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. It is the practice of making your content usable by as many people as possible. So we want people with disabilities to be able to perceive, understand, navigate and interact with the web and contribute to the web. According to the American with Disability Act, accessible websites do not require people to see hear or use a standard mouse in order to access the information and services provided. That means that no matter what type of computer or handheld device you're using or someone is using, you should be able to access the same information without encountering any barriers. And in 2018, the Department of Justice clarified that websites are considered places of public accommodations and should therefore comply with Title III of the ADA. And that's why we see an onslaught of lawsuits right now. And in March 18 of 2023, the Department of Justice published guidance on web accessibility and Americans with Disabilities Act. And again, the guidance reiterated the department's stance on website accessibility. So before the content 
can be made public. It should be accessible for Title II and III of the ADA and Section 508 if you happen to work for the federal government and or a contractor for the federal government. So now let's talk about assistive technology. What is assistive, assistive technology? It is any item, piece of equipment, or product system that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. And here are some of the examples. Screen readers, such as JAWS or NVDA, interprets and presents content in an application, operating system, or web page to the user as speech, sounds, or refreshable braille. A screen magnification software, such as ZoomText, it enlarges the contents of the screen, allowing users with low vision to read and view contents with more detail. And that is about a 1.2x to 16x. Screen readers and screen magnifications are the most common types um, of assistive technologies used by persons, but you also have adaptive keyboards, which you will see, see right here. And an adaptive keyboard is a commercial keyboard that is modified to allow a user access to the computer system. And this can include bright colored keyboards, it can include easy to read labels, QWERTY or ABC layouts, customized overlays. And then the final one, which is what my daughter uses, a braille keyboard. Therefore, assistive technology helps people who have difficulty speaking, typing, writing, remembering, pointing, seeing, hearing, learning, walking, as different types of abilities require different assistance. So web accessibility encompasses all disabilities, cognitive, visual, auditory, motor, and speech. So now we're gonna review some of those barriers. So for auditory disabilities, Things like the audio content, such as videos with voices and sounds, without captions or transcripts, that's going to be difficult. Media players that do not display captions or don't have volume controls. Or web-based services, including web applications that rely only on voice. For those with visual disabilities, images, controls, and other elements that do not have alternative text. So it's a, pic a picture that does not have alternative text to explain to the individual what the picture is. Text, images, page layouts that cannot be resized or that lose information when you do try to resize it. Text and images with insufficient contrast between the foreground and the background color combinations. And again, we'll talk about all of these. For speech disabilities, web-based services, again, including web applications that rely on interaction using voice only, or websites that offer phone numbers as the only way to communicate. We see less of that now. For cognitive disabilities, complex navigation mechanisms and page layouts that are difficult to understand and use. Complex sentences that are difficult to read and unusual words that are difficult to understand moving, blinking, or flickering content and background audio that cannot be turned off can cause seizures and migraines. And then finally, physical disabilities, websites, web browsers, authoring tools that do not provide the full key su keyboard support that is needed. And then also insufficient time limits to respond or complete a task, such as filling out a form or filling out an application. So now we're gonna move forward and talk about creating accessible content. And I'm gonna turn it over to Sitla Lee Rioja to introduce herself. Take it over, Sitla Lee. Hi, Kim, thank you. Hi, everyone, my name is Sitla Lee Rioja and I am an accessibility tester. I am also visually impaired. But we're going to get a bit technical. We're going to talk about the nitty gritty of how to make your content accessible or how you can make corrections to it. So let's go. Next slide, please. Uh, Kim, next slide, please. You don't see it. It's oh, there we go. It changed. Thank you. So again, we're going to touch on accessibility and who defines what is accessible. In this case, for anything that is website accessibility, anything that has to do with the World Wide Web, it would be WCAG. WCAG, which is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, 
those are made by the W3C, so the Web World Wide Web Consortium. These, the WCAG is a document. It is very large, and there is a lot open for interpretation. So you have to be very confident on how you apply it to your website, or if you even have the content that anything there should be applied. Again, uh, WCAG does document and does explain what can be made accessible, what can be done there, but it isn't always correct. We're going to talk about this a little bit further when we go into UI and UX, so be patient with me. Next slide, please. After that, we do have WCAG conformance levels, which are A, AA, and AAA. We are going to take a video as an example. So with A, you want to avoid causing seizures, so no flashing lights. You want to consider showing the speaker visibly. So anyone who wants, who can read lips will do it. And maybe make things clearer, just showing their appearance or just showing their face can do a lot. You want to add captions. Now at level A, captions can be auto-generated. At level double A though, we do need synchronized captions. This means somebody has gone through them, has corrected any type of spelling errors, any type of stopping in the pace. If it is a document or if it's something very necessary, if the person has a lot of stuttering, sometimes people prefer to take the stuttering away from the captions and just add the word. Uh, this is again, depending on who your captioner is there has to be visible overlay. This means the captions that you have in the video need to be seen. This is mostly done through YouTube. This can be done to anything. We don't recommend just adding an overlay with captions to your video. You don't know if anyone is going to watch the video in a very big screen or they're going to watch it in the phone. So there might be a lot of things there. You do need to add audio descriptions if possible, um, especially for anything that is only visible in the video. So let's say there's text in the background of the video. That's when you want to add captions, just letting people know what the text behind you says or what anything that hasn't been narrated says. For a triple A, and this is very hard to get, you need transcriptions available. This means anything that happens in the background, if there's additional sounds, if the person is doing a lot of hand motions, if they're moving a lot, if their expression changes, or if there's anything that might afflict or might change anything that's in the content needs to be added to that transcription. So an action, if I'm looking from side to side, if I'm moving my hands, anything like that. There needs to be audio descriptions. So once in a while, the video should stop and a description of anything that's happening in the background might appear. And there does need to be a sign language interpreter. This is very important and it does depend on which country you're at. Sign language is not universal, so there's a lot of difference there. It can also depend on the community that you're at or what you're trying to talk about. Next slide, please. We're going to talk about poor. Now, this are, these is, it's kind of complex to explain, so be a bit patient with me. Poor are the four principles of accessibility. Now, it is P for perceivable. So this is anything that has to do with perceive being something. This can be, can I look at the website? So it affects people with visual disabilities and with hearing disabilities a lot. O, operable. Is this something that I will need just my mouse to operate? Will I need a keyboard? Is anything dependable, device dependable? 
it does affect a lot of people with motor disabilities. You, understandable. Are you able to understand the content? Is it simple? Is, do you need a degree to understand this? Is this something that I might need a glossary for? So this can affect people with cognitive disabilities if it's just a wall of text. R, and this is where we get a bit more confusing. R is for robust. This means, is the content actually compatible with assistive technology? Does it affect as many people as it? I think it does. So it does affect a lot of people with motor disabilities in that most of the websites are only compatible with a mouse, but not only compatible with a keyboard. And it does affect a lot of people with cognitive disabilities because there's a lot of content that is missed and isn't actually easy to understand or easily accessible or easy to find. Next slide, please. And I have a question, so I'm going to stop here um, because they're back okay. to back. Um, the first question was, do these regulations apply to sole proprietors and private businesses? These regulations apply to anyone with public facing information. So if you have a website that's public facing, i.e. people are coming on there to buy something, to purchase something, to order something, to apply for something, they are applicable. The second question um, was someone with a micro business would have to hire someone with technical skills and knowledge. What you would really need, or I would say at this point right now is you would obviously have your website developer, your designer who would put your website together. And then if you wanted to make sure it was accessible, and for those of you that are on this call right now, if you're on this call at the end, we're gonna offer everyone a free assessment of their website. So we will let you know where your website stands in terms of accessibility and then we'll talk you through what your next steps are. So you would need someone who understands how to ensure um, that you're creating an accessible um, website. So website, website developer, they're not going to necessarily understand accessibility because they're not trained on it, no fault of their own. Some are more savvy than others. <laughs> Um, and you will also learn a little bit later, and I'll have Sitlali, Sitlali, if you'll remember, to talk a little bit about what are some better websites to use, WordPress, Square, et cetera, that already okay. have some of those accessibility features built in mind. So that can also help you because I am a small business as well. So I certainly understand. So thank you for the questions. Um, okay, Sitlali, I'm going to move you to your next slide. Thank you. We're going to talk about alternative text. First things first. Alternative text is a description of an image that is recognized by screen readers. This is something that appears through code. Again, if you're using anything from Squarespace to WordPress to even Facebook, you will have the option for alternative text. What you need to take into account for writing alternative text is what is the purpose of this image? If an image is just decoration, it really doesn't need alternative text. What the image wants to communicate. So if the image has any type of text, that needs to be included in the alternative text. Or if the image is for sales, I really love those, especially when they have alternative text because people get very creative there. Now, what is the subject or focus of the image? Is it important to have let's say my background just being white, does that need to be described? Not really, but if I'm the subject of the image, then you need to describe me as a person. And what is the tone of the image? It can be from memes, it can be something very technical that needs a very detailed description. Next slide, please. how to describe a person. This is very important, especially if you are the subject of your picture. Now, we do have an example image here. We do have two options for description available. The alternative text for this image can be person riding on a train. Perfectly acceptable. It does explain what's happening. It does give you a subject. Number two, if you want to be more detailed, a black woman wearing glasses is riding a train while she looks at her phone and smiles. That gives you a lot more context. 
it also adds a bit of flavor. And it that can not also add just a full description, a better experience for someone who is using their screen reader, but can also help with your SEO. Next slide, please. So images of text. We do have an example here too. We want to convert a poster to text. Right now, we want to give the same information. So that would be a one-to-one -one description. So we want to give them the program of the department, which is an open house for Princeton's university. Uh, we want them all interested or curious sophomores are cordially invited. And we give them the time, which is 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. on Tuesday, February 21. And we give them the address. We also add that food will be served, which is something very important. But again, we do want people to have all the information. Is it important for the description that there is a border to this image? Not really. It doesn't add any new information. If you want to add something of a descriptor of a text that is very fancy, you can add fancy, but it is very important that you understand the difference between alternative text that might add context and alternative text that might bog the description down. Next slide, please. Now, adding alternative text is, will depend on your CMS. Again, if you're using Squarespace or if you're using WordPress, it does depend. And it, the final format that you're using, again, will depend. So you can describe an image in context. So you can check the creative images. They don't have any descriptions. Their alt text should be empty. Uh, decorative images and anything that is in the background, unfortunately, usually has a description or alt text as their name. So if you're using your background, let's say results one background number 12, that would show up as an image description. And we want to make sure that is empty. We want to keep the descriptions concise roughly at 140 ch characters. And we don't want to use words of graphic or image. So no graphic of, image of. And sometimes we want to ask help from a client. Now, our example image is a Siberian tiger charging. I would have no idea that that is a Siberian tiger. But if you have a publication, a scientific publication, and you need to identify the animals correctly, then that might be important for you. If you have just an example here, it could be just a tiger. But we do need to take all of that into consideration. Next slide, please. Color and contrast. Now, color and contrast refers to the difference of light in between the font or anything that is in the foreground and what is in the background. There are strict rules. So WCAG does give us a strict rule here. Contrast must be 4.5 to 1 ratio for any image, image of text, text, or icon, except logos. So if your logo is not accessible, if it has alternative text, you guys are saved. No need to change it. Number two, contrast for large text and focus boxes need to be at least three to one ratio. So we do have an example of a color wheel. You can just test this out in websites. So we always recommend Anaguru, the contrast checker, which is something we can add. But you will be receiving a PDF after this that will have any type of links that you need. So don't worry you will need to make sure that any type of text can be read there. We go for 
captioning and transcripts. Now, there are some important steps here. And especially to make anything that is audiovisual content accessible, you want to communicate in more ways than one. This means that if there's text behind me or this, there's something that their narrator said but is not in the captions, you have failed. So you want to make sure that you communicate in more ways than one. You want to give options for volume, caption size, colors, and languages. You want to make sure that for deaf or hard of hearing users, you provide a good transcript for the audio content or asynchronized captions, depending on the level of WCAG you want to get to. Now, you want for visually impaired, you want to provide a good video. So anything that has transitions, anything again that has any type of captioning, any type of text in the background needs to be added to the captions. And that can be said. So this is the opposite example. If the captions say something or there's just a noise in the background, it might be good to have a narrator says something is happening in the background or somebody just walked through the door and walked through the background. That can be good so people are not missing any type of information. And you also want to make sure the media player that you're using is accessible. YouTube is the most popular and it does have all those options for transcripts and for accessibility. Next slide, please. We have descriptions for media content. So to get good closed captions, you always have to remember to create a script. No matter what you're doing, always have a script. Uh, this will help you later when you are trying to make your captions and making sure that all of the grammar is correct, making sure that all the names are spelled correctly, this will be a big help. You want to get a transcript if you have any live events. So if you have a live event like this one, we will get a transcript from any captioning that you take, and that can be uploaded to the video, and it can be either changed or corrected if there's something wrong. And you also always, always, always want to review spelling, especially if you have a hard name like mine. It, it's never correct. And also you want to make sure that any type of name for corporations, for organizations are spelled correctly, especially if they're your partners. Now, when is a description necessary in a video? When information is conveyed in a matter to be only visual or audio, either or, or both, uh, for people with disabilities to miss information. You want to cover all your bases. You always want to make sure that you are giving the same information to everyone. Next slide, please. Typography and text layout. This is something I like very much. Now, the minimum size font is 12 points and 14 if the style is bold. Uh, the equivalence in percentages can be used in anything that is digital. A large text is considered from 18 points and up. So that's very large. The line height, and this is line spacing, should be at least 1.5 times the font size. And the spacing following any paragraph should be at least two times the font size. Letter spacing or tracking uh, is at least 0 0.12 times the font size. And the word spacing is at least 0 0.16 times the font size. These are very clear rules, luckily. So they are very easy to understand. We will be speaking about typography, but in our example here, this is a Stillograph company logo by Herb Lubelin, and this was made very long ago. Now, Stillographs used to make any logo like that. It used to be very curvy. It has a lot 
of decoration to it, but that makes it very hard to read. So there was a payoff there. This is luckily still considered accessible because it has a description under it. So next slide, please. We're going to talk about our choices for typography. This is for any type of accessible fonts. So not all fonts are designed for web accessibility. And again, what CAC has defined a large text as 18 or larger and a regular as 12 points or 14 points if it's bold. So this depends on the typography that you choose. Now, you want to avoid any type of embellishments like our, example, our previous example or any type of the little legs, anything that might make it hard. A good test for this is if the L, lowercase l, and the number one cannot be up, told apart just by sight, it is not correct. You want to enable your website visitors to increase or decrease the size of text at least at 200%. So anything needs to be easy to, read, to be read. There are some fonts that are made to be accessible. So like Open Dyslexic, which is specifically made for people with dyslexia. It does make it easier to be read. And you can use anything that is like our examples, Helvetica. So any sans serif family fonts are good. You want to use Verdana, you want to use Times, which is one of the only serif family fonts I usually recommend. Uh, you want to use Century God, Thick, Tahoma, or Courier. Those are easy to read at a distance, and you can tell differences between numbers and letters. Next slide, please. So keyword input. This is very important for navigation. Some people cannot use a mouse. And that includes many older users with limited fine motor control. Now, all actionable elements, this is buttons, links, anything like that, must be activated by keyboard, as well as emulators like screen readers and pointers. So alternate input devices. This is usually an issue for anything that is a drop-down menu. You need to make sure that your drop-down menus are activated by keyboard. People with disabilities can use assistive technologies to just mimic the keyboard or use speech input. So you can navigate just using your voice. And an accessible website is one that can be used in more ways than one. So any type of device. Next slide, please. You want to provide keyword focus. Any actionable item needs a focus box. So users with alternate means of input. Our example here will be just a keyboard and users that need just a pointer to navigate can and will not lose their way in the website. So let's say you're navigating through a main menu and the screen reader might not be working. You don't use a screen reader and you only have your keyboard, your mouse just broke. How difficult is it to find what you're looking for just using your keyboard in your own website? Sometimes a focus box is very useful. So a focus box should be at least three to one contrast ratio and should have two to three pixels of border. So it can be easily seen, it's understandable, and it will let you know where you are, either in the main menu or if you're putting up a form. Next slide, please. Now, navigational structuring and tagging. This is where we get a bit more technical. You need to understand that some people, and especially screen reader users, can navigate just through the headings. Now, what are headings? Headings at and nest them logically. So there are like titles and subtitles. They give hierarchies to your website and let people know what information is in each page. So if a screen reader user just navigates through headings, heading level one, 
So H1 will be the main title for your page. And you need to make sure that they are logically labeled. So no skipping heading level twos and just going through heading level threes. There does need to be some added information there. Think of this as, again, titles and subtitles. If you don't know that a subtitle is there, how will you know that there is a sub subtitle? So a lot of context is very important there. Headings should be created through hierarchies. And you want to make sure that content structure is there. Headings will help you, but any type of markup content that uses appropriate elements. So you need to make sure to mark la or label links as links, buttons as buttons, and any type of footer as a footer. So you need to make sure that that is labeled. This can be done through code. It might be a bit hard if you don't have the support there, but there are tools already set in your CMS. Next slide, please. You want to provide meaningful links. Now, give your links a unique and descriptive name. You want to use the text to properly describe where the link will take you. So any type of context that you can add, it's good. Sometimes it's just as easy as adding uh, a link to a university here. The link would be the whole phrase, not just the here part. That will give a lot of context for someone who is just navigating through links. And the most unique content of the link should be presented first. Now, for example, if there, there's a visitor and you're pointing them to their About Us page, don't try to do click here to read about us or about our company. That's long and that might not work. Instead, use uh, to learn more about our company, read about us. Now, the name of the page would be where you are directing them. It is also the name of the link. So there is no open consideration and there is no confusion there. And when impossible, you can also use alternative text. Next slide, please. the skip to main content link. This is something that isn't actually known by a lot of developers, a lot of people who are outside of the accessibility circle. So you must have a skip to main content link for every page. A skip nav or skip to main content link allows us to jump from before the main menu to after the main menu. So where the content of the page actually starts. This is something repetitive for a lot of people who don't use the mouse or who cannot skip the main menu. You have to listen to it again and again and again for each and every page that you're on. So it does get a very repetitive and a lot of people just give up and kind of leave the website, which is what we don't want. Do not use display none. Now, this will hide the skip nav link or anything like that that is hitting, but it will also hide it from screen readers. So it will defeat the purpose of the skip to main content link. Next slide, please. Moving, flashing, and blinking content. Make sure that any type of counter can be adjusted and it can include the opportunities to be either paused or turned off. Note that any content that blinks more than three times uh, will trigger seizures. So three times in a second will tr trigger seizures. It is something very dangerous and something that we do want to have you very conscious about. Now avoid any fast high contrast changes that may either trigger seizures or migraines. This means if your website is completely black and white, it can trigger seizures or it can trigger migraines just because of the sudden color change if you're moving very fast with a mouse. Next slide, please. Now, steps for an accessibility check. This is something that we do here at Results One. 
we select your compliance level, which would be WCAG 2.1 double A. WCAG 2.2 is set to come out this year, but you can wait sitting down because it might take a while. We do automated audits. So what automated audits go from 25 to 30% of any of the issues that you have in your website, a bit missing. So the rest of that information is manual audits. This is when someone who has a disability goes through your website and uses assistive technology to test every page that you want tested. We go to remediation where people fix the issues. So anything that might be wrong there can be fixed. And then we go for regression testing. We do another round of automated audits and manual audits. Finally, you get compliance. This is where we tell you you guys are accessible or if there's another issue that might not be yours, it might be a third party, it might be your CMS, it might be a video that you don't control, we do the accessibility statement. So the accessibility statement is where anything like that, any problem that you might have goes. Or it also gives you a check or a date for your next accessibility check. It also gives you the compromise to accessibility and to create accessible content. Because once everything is done, you're compliant until the day you have your accessibility statement. If you change your whole website after that, the accessibility statement is null. Then we get to monitoring. You never want to get lazy with your monitoring. You always want to keep it in mind. It can be quarterly, it can be monthly, it can be every once a year, twice a year. It depends on your content and how much you change your website. Next slide, please. And so Lali, can you um, talk a little bit about um, right now, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of and a lot of the lawsuits are around websites that make the decision to put on automatic overlays and, yes. um, and automatic overlays sometimes announces that you did not do the whole process, i.e. the manual audit, and that's what they're tracking. So can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of those so that everyone is really clear when they're using them, what they're really purchasing? Sure. Okay, anything that is an automated overlay, anything that is a supposedly one button fix, it really isn't. Accessibility is kind of complex and it does depend on your CMS. It does depend on what type of content you have. So if your content is mostly videos, then yeah, it's going to be very hard for someone to find a color and contrast issue unless the tool just looks at the whole video, which it doesn't. It just looks at the screenshots or anything that you have there. And it is kind of a coverall. It does give you a lot of options. It gives you the options to change the colors of the website. It gives you the options to change the size of the text there. But it's kind of trying to cover the sun just with your thumb. You will have a lot of issues that might be background issues. So anything that has to do with ARIA might not be there. Some overlays can are capable of adding skip to main content links, but if there isn't a main content there, there might be an issue. As a pro for them, you can use those overlays while you're working with your accessibility. So it's kind of, while I'm doing this for my website, or while I'm creating another website that will be accessible, I can use this for the moment. It isn't something that we recommend you keep for more than a month because a lot of people are actively looking for those websites, actively looking for those widgets and trying to find people just to sue. Thank you. And I, and I love the comment from Qua. There is no pro for overlays. It is all cons. It makes it much harder. <laughs> Some assistive technology users, and that's another reason of why you would not want to use it. There is a question: um, Is there a replay? What in I'm what context? Sure I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Dr. Margarita Clement. If you want to come off mute, I'm not sure what you mean either. Sorry, or just yeah. I had I, I had technical problem with my iPad. Right. We got the shortage, so I missed part of this presentation. Ah, 
The presentation will be recorded, so you can find it later. Okay, thank you so kindly. No problem. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so internal accessibility checks. This is something we want to get you guys on the track of. And if you need help, there's never shame asking for help. Now, the content that you generate, any content that is generated must first have a draft where you go through it with your first checklist. This is where you go, is it intelligible? Is there a wall of text here that might be bad? Uh, are all my colors correctly? Is this what I actually want to say? Is If you're starting to look at images, this is where you want to do your first pass at alternative text. Now, if there are passes the reviews, well done. Your second draft will be generated. This is where we do our final accessibility check just before it is published. So if you have any type of issues, if you have anything that you're not sure of, this is where you would contact somebody else, an expert that will tell you, yes, in this context for this type of tool, this type of content, will be accessible or no, you would need to change this and then it will be accessible. Always, always, always remember to make this a loop and double check once you fixed. If anything has been fixed, it does need to be reviewed again just to ensure that it is actually accessible. Next slide, please. User interface versus user experience. So UI versus UX. Now, accessibility and usability do mix and they do make inclusive design. It is a Venn diagram. Some websites can be 100% accessible. They can get 100% compliance from WCAG. However, these websites might not be usable at all. This is because they might be very rigid and they have nothing else just a lot of text that can be considered accessible, but is it really usable? Is it marketable for you? Is that something that you can change? We want to make sure to take both into advance. Now, some CMSs have issues with templates, and we do want to give you a workaround and not having to change your whole website if it's only just a tiny part. Let's say the titles don't function correctly. This is something that you can add by code. So we want to make sure that we take everything into account. And this is why manual testing is, again, so very important. Actual use, actual opinions for, from a human person are very important for anything that is experience. Next slide, please. User interaction versus user experience. Now, you want to convey information in multiple ways. This is something we've told you a lot of times in a lot of multiple ways. You want to use headings and title elements. So anything like that will make finding your content easier for someone who is just using screen readers. You want to avoid device dependency. So you want to make sure that nothing functions just from a mouse. They also function from a keyboard. You want to inform your users if there are any additional features in your website. So if you have any hot keys in your website, if you have any shortcuts for your website, you want to make sure that is announced first because a lot of them might come into friction with anything that is a screen reader hot key. So you want to give people options to disable non-essential functions. If you have music playing in the background of your website, you are in the year 2000, but you also need to put a stop or a pause button. You want to leave enough space. You want to leave enough space for people to earn different things and for people to actually be able to pick your options or read the content that you have. Now, everything that is interaction. However, where does user experience come from? You want to repeat the content that occurs in the same order for each and every one of your pages. So your main menu cannot change from your main home page to your contact us page. That would make no sense. This is not something very common nowadays, but it used to be before. 
you want to avoid any type of sensory characters. You can say left to right. So because people don't have the context of what is left to right or how much to your left if you don't have visual context for it. You want to consider the orientation of the content, especially right now where everything goes to your phone. So don't design web pages that are just for your computer, especially right now. You want to add clear instructions. It doesn't matter that they might seem obvious to you. Some people are going there for the first time. So this is found in forms a lot. With the asterisk or with the star, we just assume that it means required if you have a lot of forms to fill. But it might not always be the case. Always put instructions up ahead before the form. Next slide, please. We're going to go into basic printed requirements. Now, printed requirements are a bit tough. You want to make sure that if you have requirements, such as if you're trying to make a, some, a pamphlet, let's say, for people who are blind, which is possible, you want to make sure that you have the correct tools. So I know a lot of people are not familiar with Braille, but a lot of people might have Braille displays right now. You need to make, make sure that their Braille embosser is used. And you want to make sure that the embosser does not interfere with any type of QR code that you might have in the pamphlet because you want to give people options for new things. You want to make sure that the paper that you use is not glossy and that it does keep its shape. So if you open up a pamphlet, it can be read even if you're not holding it. You want to avoid anything that is a wall of text. So you want to break that up with images and that might also be embossed. There are some options like the example for a Google cart that used to come embossed, but you don't want to lose any type of text or easy readability because of the embossing. You want to make sure that you have options again for anything like that. This is very important for anyone who has or is part of a university. You need to take those things into account, especially if you have any type of images, you don't want to emboss over them. You don't want to share that space. Everyone needs to have their own space with basic navigation. Next slide, please. Now, present representative illustration. Pictograms or anything like that should have a height of at least six inches, 150 mm minimum. So characters and braille should not be located in a pictogram's place. This can be any type of cognitive symbols, any type of accessibility symbols, any type of speech symbols, anything that might let people know, oh, this is for me. Now, each and every disability does have representation representative illustrations. And we will be handing out a link for where these illustrations are found and where they can be downloaded for free. But also you want to make sure that you're using the correct ones. Uh, this is a very common case and uh, happy autism month, especially. Uh, it is a lighted up blue type of case. So you don't want to use anything that is a puzzle piece to represent people who have autism or who are autistic, because that might be considered as, oh, they're missing a piece. That isn't really nice to say. It's kind of derogatory. It's bad. So there are a lot of campaigns for light it up red or red instead. This has been chosen and the autistic community is okay with it. The correct symbol for the autistic community would be an infinity symbol with a rainbow. So that's very nice. Next slide, please. You want to use inclusive language. You always want to ask. So this is a case of emphasizing the person before the disability or the disability before the person. 
it does depend on the person. So I refer to myself as someone who is visually impaired. So I come first before my disability. But that might not be the case. There are people who identify themselves as blind or it really does depend. So don't be afraid to ask. It's always better to have either a double check or to be conscious of and cordial with people. It is also a case of deaf with a capital D versus deaf with a lowercase d. So one of them represents a community and this deaf community and one of them just represents a condition. So it really does depend on what people want to be called. It really does depend on what people want to be referred as. Next slide, please. So this is your accessibility checklist. This one is very small. We want to check that you're using authoring tools that are integrated with accessibility checks. So Word, anything that is done by Microsoft, does have accessibility checks ingrained. It is a good place to start or where you can make drafts. Anything that is, let's say, if you have a Gmail and you're creating a document, you will have accessibility checks available to you there too. You want to review your alternative text. You want to make sure that everything is spelled correctly. You want to test your contrast for anything that you make. You want to review your spelling for captions. This is very important. You want to navigate your design only using your keyboard. This will give you a lot of context for what navigation is like for people who only use their keyboard or for people who use screen readers. You want to test the skip to main content link. This link is easily broken. So you want to test it just before you launch anything. And you want to review the text for your links. Make sure that they are unique. Next slide, please. And with that, we are done. Kim? Yes, and so as I mentioned earlier, for those of you that are on here, if you're interested in learning your compliance risk, whether you're compliant, semi-compliant or non-compliant, as well as your top high risk issues, what are those issues? Um, obviously, we have been, uh, Cecilia, Cecilia reviewed them with us today. What you need to do is send your website's URL to K Alfonso DC, K-A-L-F as in Frank, O-N as in Nancy, S-O-D-C at results1llc.com, R-E-S-U-L-T-S-O-N as in Nancy, E-L-L-C.com for a free automated audit. Um, once, we, once you send that to us, we will run a free automated audit on your website. I will then send you an email where I will request that you schedule a 30 minute session with both myself and Sitla Lee, who is one of the few certified accessibility testers in the world, I will say proudly. Um, and we will review the top high issues with you. And then we will also discuss next steps towards accessibility. Um, and if you happen, sometimes I've, you all might have one or two, that's fine, you can send us two. So if you happen to have two websites, we're okay with checking um, both of them. 